Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I don't think I've ever had like a better, more, more sweet introduction than that. Uh, yeah, and I think it's, I, I find it absolutely amazing that I'm here at the hotspot of D3, where it's in the Netherlands. It's like me and Jan Willem Tulp. <laughs> tweet, 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 nothing. So it's wonderful to meet you people and see what you're working on and be inspired by you and then getting back home and hopefully making more data visualizations. So the thing is that, you know, I, I don't have much trouble saying no to things that I don't think I'll enjoy, at least I think I am. However, I'm pretty bad at saying no to things that seem awesome, and that's why I've had a to-do list with personal projects besides my laptop since December of 2014, when I first discovered my passion for the visualization of data. You know, I do cross things off every now and then, but new items appear just as fast. And during this talk, I'd like, I sort of like to take you through one of my favorite personal projects. And I feel that also that um, these personal projects have given me opportunities that I didn't even know I was looking for and that it also played a really big role in me being able to pursue a freelance career now almost three years later. So my favorite personal project that I think you've <laughs> heard of maybe <laughs> yesterday and, uh, and now is uh, one I did together with, well I am doing still together, with uh, Shirley Roos right there. Um, and we're both data visualization designers, freelancers. Uh, but yeah, she's in San Francisco, I'm in Amsterdam, which creates a nice, a nice dynamic. So to set the scene, a little bit of background. Is this, if I turn this on. And then the battery should work. I could just press the button, but then I need to crouch down every time. So I was hoping this is gonna work. Well, no, I guess not. I'll be doing it the old fashioned way then. All right, so Shirley and me first met virtually in a DataVis kind of Slack channel and then met a few months later at OpenVisConf in 2016, where we both had the honor to speak uh, and we really hit it off during those three days. A few weeks later, I was creating tutorials about the different aspects of my talk and then Shirley really jumped on them, started asking me all kinds of questions about GUIs and mixed blend modes and stuff. And somewhere during those chats, we started lamenting the fact that we hadn't created as many well, more advanced data visualization projects in the previous year. We'd been busy with other stuff like creating tutorials or, or that, that kind of thing. Uh, and then suddenly, out of the blue, Shirley asks me, do you want to collaborate and, and create stuff then? And I think it took me mere seconds to reply with an all capital, yes, that's good. And that's, uh, and that's how Data Sketches was born. <laughs> so, so in the <laughs> thank you, thank you. So in the following uh, week, we kind of figured out that we both liked the idea where we would create a visualization each month around a specific topic and and do that for a year, to see how two people would create two visualizations starting from the same seed but then diverging into different paths based on our own interest in history. And besides sharing this end result, we also really wanted to write about the creation process. And we split this up into the three pillars that we find most important, data, sketching, and coding. And initially, we thought we could pull data sketches off with about hmm, five to six hours a week. <laughs> but you know, you know, real life really doesn't care about plans, especially coding plans. So since so starting, we've clocked many, many hours into creating a visualization uh, each month. And during this talk, I'd actually like to take you through some of the lessons that I've learned, challenges faced, and insights that I gathered along the way. So to start off with the most fundamental aspect of data visualization, the data itself. So we often get the question of how did you find the data? But it's often not the data that first leads us, sometimes, but usually not. It's the topic of each month that first gives a spark, um, an insight that we might want to reveal and how we could visualize that. And once we have this more, more concrete angle, do we investigate to see if we can find some appropriate data? For example, for November, the topic was books, pretty broad. But I really wanted to focus on fantasy books, and even more specifically, the themes and titles of fantasy books. And once I have that more concrete angle, I do nothing more special than just Google the web, combining my more specific idea together with the words data or data set, and then having the patience to click and investigate each link <laughs> in the first two or three pages of results. And this has led me to Google spreadsheets containing thousands of rows of Olympic medal winners and GitHub repos with wonderfully unique data sets, such as one about the words spoken in the Lord of the Rings, and a data set about um, a, a huge family tree of 3,000 people connected to royalty going back more than a millennia. 
I've also learned that website design says nothing about the quality of the data that it shares. <laughs> because I think there are some uh, comic sounds in here. Um, but anyway, there are also websites that have, have structured information, but not in some ready to download format. So instead, you have to scrape the logical layout of the website and then put the information that you need in a file yourself with the help of some code. INDB, for example, has a search functionality that returns a list of movies. And each of these movies is contained within the same uh, layout of divs and other elements. So I can then download the HTML structure and with the help of a script, search for all of the elements that follow a certain styling. Uh, the movie titles could be contained within a div of class title, for example. Or another one, on Amazon I was able to find the 100 best-selling fantasy authors that I could use then for my, my books month. And there are also APIs from which you can request information. Although I have to admit I, I don't often use them because they can be a bit of a hassle to set up, but sometimes the wealth of information is just too good to ignore. For example, with the author names that I'd scraped from Amazon, I then used the Goodreads API to request the top 10 most rated books of each of these authors, gathering information about the number of ratings, the average rating, and of course, the titles of the books. Well, another good strategy can be to just ask others for advice. So for April, our topic was movies. No, it wasn't movies, it was community, right. It was community, and I wanted to do something about Earth, something that would sort of fit with the World Wildlife Fund but I couldn't get my angle any more concrete than that. So I just asked around on Twitter for advice, ideas, data, anything. And luckily I got a dozen or so interesting links, which then led me to new links and so on and so on, until I finally came across this website, where I saw an image of the amount of greenness that is measured from space in a day in June. And I knew when I saw this that I'd found my hook. I really wanted to visualize the same information but then slowly, smoothly transition throughout the year and try my own spin on the visual styling, which eventually led to this result. And although it was technically complex, it was a lot of data, uh, the, the, the visual result is very minimalistic. Just a title and a simple legend, I think are all that's needed to understand what you're looking at uh, pretty fast. And of course, you can also create a data set completely manually. So for our nostalgia month, I decided to dive into Dragon Ball Z. And I found these lists on the Dragon Ball Wikia page that contained all of the fights that happened during all of the episodes, which I then just copy pasted into Excel. And with the help of Excel's functions, I split that apart into the characters and some other meta information about the fights. And it took me about two hours to get this data set of 200 fights ready, which I still think is less time than if I try to create a script to handle all the nuances of the text in these lists. Or if I actually try and spend two hours finding a proper data set on the characteristics of butterflies and have to resign myself that the best option seems to be contained within a website called Gardens with Wings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I really tried though. So again, I felt that scraping this semi-structured website was going to take more time than doing it manually, so I clicked through all of the options and copy and pasted all the information that I needed into a final data set of 87 different butterfly species. So what I hope to have shown you with all of these examples is that there's not just one specific way to find data. It's not just hardcore data analysts that have these magical skills. Data can be found in so many different ways, from, from Googling and finding the straightforward CSV or Excel file to scraping a website or even just doing it manually. But be aware that you practically always have to do some final data adjustments to get the data into the shape that is needed for your visual form. And to go a bit deeper into what those kinds of adjustments could be, for August, the obvious theme was the Olympics, especially since we're both big fans. And I ended up visualizing all 5,000 gold medal winners since the very first games in 1896. So each of these circles is a group of similar sports, where we have oh, uh, water sports, and that's ball sports, and then each of the feathers or slices within a circle represents one sport. And we have athletics over here. And then inside we have the earliest edition and then we go out to 2016. On the reddish background there are the female events and on the blue background are the male events. And finally, each of these medals is given the color of the continent in which the country lies that actually won. So Europe is blue, America is red, uh, Africa is black and so on. 
We can see, for example, that tug of war was an official Olympic sport in the first five editions. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad that disappeared. <laughs> so I actually found the data for this piece from two articles written by The Guardian for the 2012 um, Olympics in London. But, uh, but after getting a rough shape of the visual on my screen, I noticed that some very obvious medals were missing from 2012, like hockey. So suddenly my confidence in this data set dropped drastically, even coming from such a respectable source. So I had to get a, a sense of the overall accuracy, but I did not want to have to manually check each of these 5,000 medals. So I found a proxy instead. On Wikipedia, I could find numbers that would tell me the number of events that occurred for each edition. And I then compared that to the number of gold medals I had in my data set. And if there was a discrepancy, I investigated further to figure out where and why. And that's how I found out that uh, for some of the editions, the horses were also in the data set, which makes for an interesting read to suddenly see, you know, Princess and Sissy and Lady Mirka as women winning gold in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> they are quite easy to find though, which are the horses' names. Um, and so, doing these kinds of things, I, I made adjustments to my data to get it to the point where I trusted it again. So my lesson here was that, even coming from respectable sources, you should really get a sense of the overall accuracy and completeness. And missing data can actually be harder to find than wrong data. And you don't have to check every value, but think about taking sums and counts and averages and comparing this to plain common sense. Can a percentage be higher than 100% or not? Uh, or even better, a different data source. So also staying with the Olympics a bit longer, going a bit deeper into data preparation and how that can be connected to creating more unique or exotic visuals. So the standard bar and line chart are so straightforward that you can create them with whatever tool that lets you do database. You simply supply the data, and typically the program does the visual heavy lifting for you. And the more that you start to deviate from these standard charts, the more that you'll have to supply other aspects of your visualization as well, such as where on the, uh, where on the screen should the data be placed. And it can take some time to figure out and calculate these things, but it can create some really wonderful results. And the Olympic feathers, in essence, is nothing more than a whole lot of rotated and stacked bar charts. And the structure of each of these feathers is very similar. They all follow the same concept, but they also depend on each other. And at first, I tried to calculate each of the rotations of these circles and, and inner slices and in JavaScript. But after having written like 30 lines of code and still not achieving something that I knew I could do in two lines in R, which is my favorite data prep and analysis tool, <laughs> I just pulled all of these preparations into R as well. So even if they were visual variables, by which I mean that they have nothing to do with the data itself, but only with how they are laid out on the screen. So I pre-calculated the initial rotation that each of these circles would need to have, so that eventually the center would be at the bottom, how far each of these inner slices would have to be rotated based on their predecessors. Uh, but the only placement variable that I kept calculating in JavaScript to keep it dynamic was the year scale going outward, because then I could shrink or expand the circles based on screen size. But even the offset of each middle from the center is something I calculated beforehand. So even if they have nothing to do with the data, it's perfectly fine to pre-calculate these kinds of visual variables and attach them to your data set. And that can be useful more often for fixed data sets than you may think. Uh, sometimes it's just way easier to calculate these things in a different tool than whatever you're going to use to and visualize it with. For those visuals that end up living in the browser, it can also sometimes save you a lot of browser calculations, such as if you're running a force layout and it's always going to end up at the same uh, end state, you just save the end state and then load that up the, for your users instead of them having to do the entire force layout. Uh, and personally, a favorite of mine is that it makes my JavaScript a lot more easier to read. So since starting, Shirley and me have filled many pages of our notebooks with sketches because it helps us think and lay out ideas beforehand. And my sketches are often very simple, only focusing on the main abstract shape that I want to fit my data into. You know, colors and layout and details, these are things I only vaguely think about but don't act on until I have the data on my screen. There's just no use to think about these things beforehand until I figured out that the data actually works once I've morphed it into the main shape. So for the Olympics, for example, I, I was inspired by the shape of a peacock feather where there would be more emphasis on the more recent editions. 
but I had no idea if that would look all right once I finally placed all 5,000 metals together. So I had to see if the general shape would work before moving on. All right. I took a few steps but I, I, in laying out the feathers in sort of the shape that I wanted it to be. But eventually, I saw that it did show potential with the actual data. So that's only when I started worrying about um, the other aspects. The reason why there are colors here is because it's so obvious which continent should have which color that that was sort of a, a no-brainer. But sometimes there's actually no use to really start sketching. Although I will say that is very rare for me, but networks are an exception. And for our October month, I dove into royalty. I've always been intrigued by how intermarried sororals really are. You know, are they all cousins twice removed? Um, but I, I was lucky to find this, this giant genealogy data set that contained a family tree of all the European royal houses with 3,000 people and going back quite, quite far. It was from 1992, so I spent a wonderful evening on Wikipedia adding one or two more generations in the main line of succession. Uh, and checking out other things. Uh, but here is the end result that uh, you saw in Sarah's talk yesterday, where um, the current royal leaders are the bigger circles, and then everybody is connected to their parents, their partners, and their children. And see, it's always a bit slow when I have an extra sc screen, but you can hover over anybody, and then you see um, sort of how far six degrees of separation reaches into this web. Uh, and I can also click on a person and any other person. No, let's do this one. Or my king. And see, um, see how they're connected. How many steps do you need to go in generations uh, before you actually go? Or how far back do you need to go before you finally uh, go back forward again? So, but when I started out with this data set, I had no idea what it contains. So I just placed it on the screen using the most basic network settings. And then this happened. An explosion of points and lines going out of my screen. <laughs> like, woo! So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll rein in that gravity a little bit. But then, then I was left with this fun, useless hairball. Well, wait, if I color the points by year of birth, that is not helping at all. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, in uh, D3's version 4, it's now really, really straightforward to have gravity depend on a variable. Um, so I thought I, I split. I sort of pull this web apart by this year of birth. And that was improving a little bit, but it, was still, it still felt like a rather uninsightful bundle. Uh, and at this point, I'd already invested several hours into creating this visualization, you know, playing with the network settings, adjusting my data, trying different kinds of connections. And I was really ready to just give up and try a different angle, like how much are the royals spending these days? How much are they earning per second and <laughs> crying about that and such? Uh, but, but I gave it one last try. And that's when I decided to focus on the current royal leaders. So I placed these in a line, vertical line, and then I let the vertical gravity depend on how closely, you know, which of these royal leaders were you most closely related to. And I used the Bramer squish that has been established yesterday to make that year birth scale axis a little bit like random. Uh, but that's when I finally saw it, that there were insights. For example, that the Queen of Denmark, who's here, is actually very central to this web whereas the Prince of Monaco line separated from the rest almost 200 years ago. And it was only when I got to this point that I finally started worrying about more of the visual design aspects. So con um, networks always remind me of constellations, and with my astronomy background, I have a bias for all things space, so I just turned it into a starry night. And I could have never designed this visualization beforehand in Illustrator. I had to go hand in hand with the actual data and apply my design choices to all of this data simultaneously to see if the results were both engaging and insightful. So getting back to uh, actual sketching, the, um, during, during September I made my most personal visualization ever. Uh, our topic was travel and I took the opportunity to visualize all of the vacations I've ever been on. And with the help of my parents, sorting through all of my analog childhood photos and browsing my travel journals, did I manage to create a list of all of my vacations and information. And my idea was very simple for this month. I just wanted to row with for every year that I've been alive, and then colored blocks on the periods where I was on vacation. And these blocks would then be decorated, decorated to give an idea of uh, what kind of vacation it was, where did I go to, how much did I enjoy it, who I was with, and so on. So I drew this sketch around that idea. But when I, started, when I looked more closely at this sketch, you know, I, I, I noticed that I had made a rather big error in my mind. 
because I'm really only vacation, uh, on vacation for a max of like four to five weeks a year, which isn't even 10%. I mean, overall, that's not bad. But in this sketch, it looks more like I'm on vacation like a quarter or a half of the year. So if I were to then put the actual data on my screen on this idea, it would mostly be empty, which wasn't what I had in mind. So I drew a new sketch in which I tried something rather unusual. Uh, I decided to squish any month in which I hadn't been on vacation. That would make it very difficult to compare exact months across the years, but that wasn't my point anyway. I just wanted to visualize my trends in my vacations, like um, mostly sun-driven in early childhood to culture in my teens and nature these days. And by sketching it out first, I noticed that my initial idea wasn't going to work, and it guided me towards this new approach. So here is the final visualization of all 30 years of my vacations, but I guess to be honest, my favorite part of this month was really just reminiscing with my parents over old photos and, and memories. So as another example, I keep coming back to this one though, is in the, with the Olympic feather, after seeing the, um, a peacock feather and being inspired, I drew, started drawing some feather shapes and filling them with colors. And while sketching, I suddenly realized, wait, wait, the, the events themselves changed during each edition, so how would that then work? And the next day, I tried to explain my rough idea to a friend, again sketching out parts of it, and again, while sketching, I came across some logical thinking errors uh, that I needed to fix. So only by sketching out these shapes several times, catching these errors, and iterating again, did I get to a final shape that at least seemed to make sense on paper. So instead of going straight from the data or idea in your head to the computer, sketch out your design on paper first. It's the ideal way to quickly catch these thinking errors, and you, do not, you don't have to be some sort of artist to do data viz design. It's mostly circles and squares and simple curves anyway. If you cannot make it work logically on paper, it is definitely not going to work on a computer with the actual data. One other thing I try to investigate while, um, while sketching is how to add extra details. So how to, make, how to create more context around the information that I want to convey. And although the Olympic Feathers is already pretty data heavy, I couldn't resist adding information about the world and Olympic records, because every athlete there tries to break at least a ladder, if not like the world record. Uh, so I felt that was an appropriate thing to add. And I just placed a small white dot on a medal if that resulted in a broken record, such as Usain Bolt's 200 meter dash in Beijing. And a way for me to think about adding extra details is to think about the visual channels that are still free after I have my main chart standing. Now let me explain that more with a different example. So for the past 17 years, during exactly one week in the year, more than half of the Netherlands listens to the same radio station. I know we're a small country, but that's still rather unusual. <laughs> so, it, and it, nevertheless, this sort of does happen during the final week in the year when the 2000 best songs are aired, counting down to the new year. And it is quite a thing for a Dutch person, so that's why I asked Shirley if our topic for December could be music, so I could tackle these 2000 songs. Uh, and my goal was to visualize which decade was most popular in terms of song release year. And here is sort of the base visual, where each circle is a song, and they are clustered to sit at the year of release, from the 60s to today. And well, we can see here that the, the most popular decade seems to be the 70s and the 80s, and that people are sort of trying to forget the early 2000s. Um, but I felt that the, wait, let me explain this a little bit more. The size is actually the position in the top 2000, and then the color, the darker the color, the higher the position in the, um, in the weekly top 40s that it ever reached. But still, with this, I felt like there was so much more to say about it, because what about you know, bands and artists and songs and names? Uh, and also, I, I felt that the virtual was just a little bit too boring for my taste. So, I thought, I thought about what visual channels are still free. Well, I can give the circles a stroke, or I can add an extra mark on top, or I can do something with textual annotations. There's probably more, but that's sort of the things that, that came to my mind. So, a new bigger sketch was made to include these ideas for how to add extra details. And in 2016, sadly, uh, Prince and David Bowie died, so I decided to mark all of their songs and mention how this had changed with respect to the list of 2015, the year before. 
but I could also use the rankings of these songs in different ways. I could highlight the most popular band, the Beatles still, uh, which song from 2016 came in highest, which is the newest, uh, which is the highest riser or the highest newcomer, uh, and to single out that Pokemon song. Um, or to even highlight the top 10 songs more clearly by adding an extra mark on top. And I felt that by adding these extra bits of information just made the visual more easy to understand and more enjoyable and just made it visually more interesting as well. So even if your chart is making the, the main insight of your data insightful to your audience, you know, also try to add extra details. Try to use remaining visual channels to add new variables that can supply context, which can give the truly interested reader even more ways to dive into and understand the information. Well, as expected, most of our hours are filled with actually getting the data on the screen. And here are some of my perhaps less obvious coding lessons. So for our very first month, the topic was movies. And it was pretty clear for me that I wanted to do something with The Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite trilogy. And I thought there would be loads of data available because you know the movies are super were super popular, or whatever not. And I was really disappointed when I could find, couldn't really find any data until I came across someone's GitHub repo where there was a data set that contained the a number of words spoken by each character in each scene in all three extended editions of the Lord of the Rings. And I found that such an amazing data set that I knew I had to do something with it. So this was one of the times where it turned around, the data sort of informed my, my sketch. Um, and I wanted, I decided to focus on the number of words spoken by each member of the fellowship uh, at each location. But as some of you in the front may be able to see, there is no location information in this data set. So together with the online scripts of the movies and my own memory of having seen the movies way too often, I manually added location information to each row manually. Uh, you know, a little dedication can go a long way. <laughs> and I started drawing a sketch. And I quickly came upon something where the characters of the fellowship would be in the center and then the locations in a circle around that and they would be connected by these strings where the thickness of the string on the outside would represent the number of words spoken by that character at that location. But sadly, this sort of chart form didn't exist in any of the tools that I was aware of. So it did remind me of a chart that existed, namely a chord diagram. So I thought, well, what if I can transform the chord diagram into my sketch? So here we have a basic strip to fall text chord diagram. And the most fundamental thing to me was to see if I could figure out how to make these inner chords flow towards the center. And well, that um, actually took less time than anticipated. And then getting rid of the excess space. And now it was ready for the actual Lord of the Rings data and some appropriate colors. Appropriate colors. Well, we have nine members of the fellowship, so making sure that these vertical lines end up at the right location, but this was just getting way too squished. So, well, maybe I can just pull the two halves apart, but now these strings were looking rather unnatural, especially in the top and bottom part. So finally, after years, I took it upon me to learn how to create my own SVG paths to make these strings look more natural, which was the thing that took longest in this project, making, making these, these new string formulas. Uh, and that's how this new chart form sort of mutated from D3's chord diagram. And we have a lot of strings here, so I felt that uh, simple interaction could really help this chart to make, ha give people the opportunity to, uh, to get focus. So uh, you can hover over one of the locations to see which uh, members of the fellowship spoke there, or you can hover over one of the members and see like what locations did they speak. I also update the number of words so that you can see exactly how many words Gandalf spoke in the Shire. Uh, and finally, a small piece of text below to give an insight that I'd found for each of these members from this data set. And my favorite one is, I, I keep on telling this because it's, I like it so much, but Boromir, who is really only alive during one movie, manages to speak more than Legolas does in three movies. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I hope that these sort of small pieces of text can help people understand the kinds of insights they might find so that afterwards they can find their own, own stories from the rest of the data. So many people have done wonderful things that they share online. So even if you think you are creating something new, you don't always have to start from scratch. Pick the idea that most closely resembles your design and start adjusting that. Remix what's out there already. 
And there is actually nothing more, nothing that I learned more about in the past year than creating my own SVD pads and how that can give me so much more opportunities to shape my own visual. From simple curved instead of straight lines in my royalty network, to sweeping arcs in my visualization about fantasy books, to the feather shapes that I really, really, really created for these Olympic feathers project, but that never made the final cut. And the Lord of the Rings uh, arcs from just now, these strings. And another visualization that is heavily uh, built around these custom SVG pads has to do with our Nostalgia Month. And I decided to dive back into something I've been very, I was crazy about during my teens, and that was Dragon Ball Z. So for those that sadly, sadly don't know it, <laughs> Dragon, Ball, <laughs> Dragon Ball Z is, uh, is an anime and it revolves around fighting. So I thought it would only be, um, it would make sense if I make a visualization that sort of shows all of these fights and what happened during these fights. So who fought whom, what state were they in, were they Super Saiyan or some other kind of transformed state, and what, you know, which of these fights were, were very important. And here we have the base visual, where each of these clusters of circles is a separate fight, ranked from the first all the way to the last. And then from left to right, we have the different sagas, which is sort of similar to story arcs or uh, seasons. So, but to more easily follow the same character from fight to fight, I wanted to connect all of the fights from one person by a line. I just started out with a simple line zigzagging back and forth. And this is done with a collection of so-called quadratic Bezier curves, which give you the option to pull on these line sections by, by pulling on these anchor points that are typically, not, yeah, they're not visible, they're only there in the SVG formula. And to make it visually more interesting, I decided to pull harder if the distance between two fights was farther apart. And then I got some great advice for someone to use the side of a fight to denote good guys or bad guys. So swooshing on the left-hand side is good guy, on the right-hand side is bad guy, which then shows for this character, Vegeta, how he started out as a bad guy, moved around a bit, before mostly becoming some, one of the good guys. And then introducing the other characters, well, this was interesting, I found. I, I saw insights that I actually never realized before. For example, like Goku, the main character, doesn't actually fight that much because he's often dead or sick. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I just wasn't quite liking the, the, the single thickness lines. They weren't conveying the dynamic nature of these fights. So instead, I wanted to create a shape, fill that with a color, which would mimic um, a stroke of varying thickness. And as usual, I try and uh, write, sort of draw out my desired end state on plain paper and try and deconstruct it in terms of its mathematical, or in this case, SVG path elements, which came down to sort of flipping the path back up again and using different values for the amount of swoosh, as I started calling it. <laughs> and with that small change implemented, I felt that these um, lines connecting the same character between fights looked a lot more dynamically and visually interesting. So even though I was talking about SVG paths a lot right now, because so many of my visualizations are built up out of SVGs, the general lesson to learn here is that you should really try and embrace the, the advanced functionalities of your tool if you want to go beyond the standard examples. I was using D3 for two or three years before I finally decided to learn how these SVGs are really created. And it opened up such a world for me in terms of opportunities and creativity that I'd wish I'd done that sooner. Another thing that Shirley and me had a lot of fun with is math. And that brings me to our collaboration month with Google News Lab. And being a non-native English speaker, I wanted to investigate translations. So what do other languages want to have translated into English by using Google Translate? From the most translated word for 10, cho 10 chosen languages to the top 10 for these languages, and finally, the similarities between these languages. And for this top one, I wanted to string together the, the most translated word for these languages by a, a line zigzagging that would, um, that would convey the 100 most translated words overall. And preferably, I wanted something organic looking like this. But for the life of me, I could not mathematically create something, draw out something that would create such an organic swirl and be updatable and dynamic to both desktop and mobile sizes. So eventually, I just went with the idea of beads on a string slowly zigzagging down. 
but typically I make some mathematical errors on my notes and that reveal themselves once I finally code it out. But eventually I got the layout working and then depending on the screen size, um, it can either be four, a three or two beads wide. And uh, another visual on this page that was quite an interesting math and logic puzzle was the last one. So in it, two, if two languages share a word in their top 10, they're connected by a line. But initially, I really wanted to have all of the visualizations build up completely out of words. So I wanted to replace these lines by the actual words. And I guess I should have sketched that out further and not kept it in my head too much, because once I finally got that working, I knew immediately that it was a complete mess. <laughs> and I should have realized that beforehand. So I had to compromise on my idea and only show the, um, the words on the lines going towards the central chosen language. Important point here was, though, that these words should always be placed in the most upright manner possible for readability. But that gave quite some convoluted calculations in terms of the text paths on which these words are drawn, which became glaringly obvious once you click one of these uh, words to go towards the center part. And I don't think users would expect the lines to act or behave quite like this. So um, again, this is where math and logical problem solving came to the rescue. It took a few pages from my notebook to figure out the solution, but eventually I got it to, uh, to a point where I thought, well, I think this idea might actually work. Um, yeah. So now it's working the way I think you sh you'd expect it to work. And what I'm doing is really more of a hack, because once you click one of these circles, the words fade out, and then I immediately replace all of these lines with their final states, but reverse engineer to look like the initial state before transitioning them to the final state. So my lesson here is very simple. Learn to love math, if you don't already, <laughs> and especially geometry, because they are often your best friends in finding solutions to these visual problems. And I wanna, I wanna end with one of my favorite lessons. For nature, for February, our topic was nature. And I always wanted to do something a little bit more towards data art or generative art, and the apparent randomness of nature felt like a good, good match to me. And also it reminded me of butterflies, how their paths, how they fly, also is sort of random to me. So I wanted to mimic these butterfly-like paths across the screen, but that the paths themselves would be based on butterfly data. So the, the color of the line would be based on the species color, approximately. Um, the species would sort of define the line style, and the wingspan would define the thickness of the lines. And then using many, many semi-random number generators, together with inspiration from the works of Jared Tarbell and Inconvergent, did I let my butterflies free across the screen. And this is the only month in which I make no attempt to make the data insightful. I just really want to delight my audience, and it is something that is based on data. Now, to keep them hooked and mesmerized as the screen fills up with more and more butterfly paths. And creating a sense of delight can be a very useful way to keep your audience engaged, especially in the more complex visualizations. And it can be done in rather subtle and diverse ways. For example, on a flight back to Amsterdam, I didn't have any Wi-Fi, so I, could, well, I was severely limited in my options. So I just decided to create an animated legend of my visualization about fantasy books for fun. And other non-essential things that I've added are animated GIFs of the most memorable moments in Dragon Ball Z, or having hovers in my top 2000 visual for people that really wanted to dive into which, which song each circle was, or making the top 10 songs look like tiny vinyls, um, or having annotations about weird or silly events that occurred during the Olympic Games, such as Henry Pierce having to stop for docks in the rowing event and still managing to win gold. <laughs> So even though getting the data on your screen in such a manner as to make it insightful is key, it's the other things to add, such as animations, annotations, weird legends, GIFs, and more, that can make it truly unique and special and even more of delight for your audience to investigate. So take the time to think about these aspects as well. And then the final aspect to think about, and the best aspect of doing a collaboration, is the fact that you're not in it alone. So even though uh, we created our visualization separately, we shared our results throughout the process. Uh, from discussing initial ideas, to sharing in the joy of finding an appropriate data set, and of course sending across loads of screenshots uh, and photos of sketches and works in progress to ask for feedback. 
And we started out as two people who sort of knew each other through Slack and had a good time at a conference. Uh, but we developed an incredible friendship throughout that year. And we talk about so much more these days, like celebrity, best, celebrity crushes and such. And it's like <laughs> all over the place. So if you ever think about you know, starting an ambitious project, try and think about getting a partner. Because working together will keep you going more easily. Uh, I was always motivated to work another evening on my own month when I saw Shirley's screenshots of her progress. But also, I didn't want to let Shirley down, so I was way more motivated to stay on track myself. Although it will be very useful if at least one of you is responsible, so you don't both slack off. <laughs> I know, we're still not done, though. <laughs> it's someone that you respect, and it's someone that you either trust or you think you can trust, because that's crucial in giving and receiving feedback. But one final thing to think about is that even though you're enthusiastic about getting started or you're already having fun, it, at some point it will get hard and it will require a level of dedication. You know, try again if you're having a bad day, but at least try again. Because with each new visual and demo and app that you create, you learn new skills. And these skills you can use on your next project and, and improve on them uh, for, for your next creation. So, in, in my opinion, these personal projects are definitely worth the time investment. So I've been taking you on a journey through my visualizations and my lessons, but of course, Shirley also made a visualization each month around her own angle on the topic. And I'll show you a sneak peek of my favorite three, and then you can ask about the others from Shirley herself or see it. Um, for example, this is her take on our movie month called Film Flowers in which she scraped the top summer blockbuster movies for every year that she's been alive and turned them into movies. So each of these flowers, or each element of these flowers, represents some value, from the size being the rating, the color signifying the genres, and the petal shape being the age rating. And so each movie turns into its own unique flower. And I so love this project due to its artful design. You could print this out, hang it on a wall, call it art, and still compare and see and, and try to find trends in these movies across the years. Well, the second one is about Hamilton. And although it was published for our Books Month in November, Shirley started working on this for a few months prior to that, because that's how crazy she is about Hamilton. <laughs> and you should definitely read her write-up in this month to see her dedication in the data gathering alone. Um, so, when you scroll through this page, you see how it sort of shows you how all of the lines that the characters spoke in the musical come together, how people sang together, what, in, what in, insights can get, you can get from them, and you can click around and filter everything. And finally, she focuses on the story arc of one person and really explains how she managed to grow up and how that became her favorite character in the end. And I really enjoy just scrolling through this page and the delight that you get when scrolling through this page and interacting with all of the different elements on this website. The last one is her take, yes, <laughs> is her take on, uh, on our music month in which she contacted the website owner of a huge DDR website asking for the data of all the moves of all the songs, which she got. See, asking is also a very good strategy. And she then turned these into spirals with time going outward. And I, again, love this one because it looks like a piece of art, but you can really get the insights from it by seeing which of the songs were hard or not, or you, by looking at these sort of when they start crossing each other, and, and you can turn off things and see basic or trick. That gives you so many ways to understand this information. And I think if you play DDR, it's even better that you can, you can sort of have your own memories of how, how that used to be. But as I said, she has created a visualization for each month. So she, you should definitely check out her other months as well, because they are all you know, fun and unique and gorgeous takes on our topics. So you know, in the last few months, I've learned to find data in the weirdest places, that sketching helps weed out thinking errors, but that you can also sketch with code. And it's not blasphemy to pre-calculate visual variables. That you can, you know, SVG pads are amazing and math is too, but we knew that already, of course. And that surprisingly small things can create a sense of delight for your audience. We didn't set out to be confronted by these things. We set out to have fun, and in that we definitely succeeded. And now that we're sort of near the end, we have another sort of thing to share with you. So please come up, Shirley. Wait, I want to give you a hug first because that was super nice. <laughs> 
Why don't you tell this? I, I feel actually a little bit bashful being here now because that was like such an amazing, like that was an absolutely amazing. Well, let me. I'm not I need done to yet. Also, yeah, I know. Never mind. Okay, this is not what it's about. Okay, so we have something that we we're really excited to share something with you, um, which is that we are almost almost. Um, we may have may have a book coming out. In, <laughs> in, uh, not coming out. We may, we may have a book deal. Sorry. Yes. That's book deal. Book a, deal. That's a, that's completely different. Um, and that um, so uh, we are in the process. We have verbal confirmation, and then sometime next week we're going to start working on the contract with the publisher, and um, we're hoping that we'll sign the contract sometime next month, late next month, and be able to say this publicly on Twitter or wherever, um, but because this is the community and the friends that brought us together, we wanted to share this news with you and our excitement, um, but if you can just keep it on the download for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we're really hoping um, that it happens, that the contract goes through. Mm -hmm. um, we're not really looking forward to writing more things, I don't think. <laughs> um, yeah. But overall, really excited to kind of share the project and um, share the tips and tricks and the things that we learned and all the advice. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Thank all right. you. <laughs> Well, as, as I said though, is that you know, we were having fun and the year has already passed, but we still have two months to go. And that's, you know, we were having fun, but at the final stretch we started, we noticed that um, we take it on too much on our plate, so we took things more slowly, we took more of a summer break. Uh, but we are really still working on, uh, on May and June. We are like in the middle of, uh, of May and doing something big, which is taking a longer time. Uh, but so if you really want to, you can still join us in our final two months of data mining and coding uh, and uh, sketching and coding it up into weird and often overly elaborate visualizations. And a uh, final thing I wanted to share is that um, at another conference I was, one of the speakers actually had stickers. Uh, and I thought that was such an interesting thing that I also brought stickers. I have a book lying over there. I like to give away books because I don't have that much space and I, there's nothing I hate more than throwing away books. Uh, so I've been giving books away at other conferences as well. So please take whatever you want from there. And then finally, I want to thank you very much for your enthusiasm and your attention. This is now where I get to say thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> for, I, I was told that I say the word amazing too often, but I think it is and awesome. And so, yeah. How was that? That was this is such a great way to kick off the day. So thank you. So um, in the interest of time, we may not do, well, should we take a couple questions? I'm fine with that. You, you, you have an answer? Yeah, let's take a couple questions. We do want to uh, start getting into the workshop soon. But I mean, I'm sure we're all super inspired and ready to go. But let's, <laughs> let's do two questions. So. He's got one. Yes. So uh, you know uh, DQ3 really well, it seems like. You can sit on a plane without Stack Exchange, and, uh, right? So one, I'll just say that's super impressive. What do you think the key was to learning it well? Um. So I do, have, uh, I do have a library of all of my data sketches on my laptop, so I often go back there to, uh, to copy pieces of code. Um, and also, it came very gradually just by doing it. The first, the first, I don't know, year, I always had to look it up how to do it. And I don't know, sometimes, sometime during a year or two years later, I found myself being able to write out a scatter plot without you know, just knowing what to write, maybe making some syntax errors, but knowing this, just by having done that so often. Also, I think it's because I'm the kind of person that I'm very vanilla. Um, so I don't have all these extra things and, and shortcuts. So I really type out everything every time. Uh, so it sort of sticks in my brain maybe more more quickly, um, but it takes longer overall. <laughs> Very impressive. Thanks. Another question? We have one more. I don't bite. Yes? Uh, do you have any particular resource that you use when you're tackling a geometry problem? A geometry problem? I don't do those uh, that very often, actually. I only had the map. Um, I mean, like around like the word, 
Um, it, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound really stupid, but you know, I, I make tutorials, uh, but the thing is I make them mostly for myself, so I can look up like, oh, how did I put text on arcs? How, what was the function for an SVG arc again? Uh, I really am a person that looks at my own tutorials here months and years <laughs> later. <laughs> well, there's also, there's also the, an online um, uh, SVG quadratic and Bezier curve tool that lets you sort of play around with all of these uh, anchor points and that you can see how that, uh, how that affects the final SVG path formula and that really helped me a lot to get an understanding of how I can sort of mathematically create something that would work for all of these strings no matter where they're placed. So that, that one's also really good. Yeah. So, great. Thank you very much.